Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Welcome back to Policy and Rights here in Depictions Media Radio. And coming into August 8th, uh, 2020, uh, we have heard of um, o- over that weekend that Israeli attacked uh, the Gaza Strip and the Palestinian communities. They were claiming that um, they were attacking the um Islamic um, extremist group, the um, PIG, and we're going to hear 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 uh, from the Israeli um, permanent representative to Israel, or, or from Israel to uh, to the United Nations, talk about, and he's and he's. Presenting uh, video evidence of how they ensure that they are not attacking civilians, they are not attacking children. And yet, in this uh, latest round of of attacks on the Gaza Strip, there were children killed, there were women killed, there were non-combatants killed. We're going to hear from both sides saying one pointing the, the, the blame at the other. One, the Palestinian saying that blame the victim. And the Israeli side saying that they are the victim and that the Palestinians are nothing but liars. That they put their hatred of Israel even before the love of their children. There, there does need to need to come to some sort of an agreement where both the Palestinians and the Israelis can live together. That the colonialism and the pushing of Israeli settlements into Palestinian territories should come to some some sort of an agreement where everybody can live together there should be a call for peace and that of course is the job of the UN and the Security Council to come up with directives to find that peace so we're going to hear uh, what happened on the UN Security Council floor we're going to hear updates uh, from the uh, press briefing for uh, August 8th, 2022, and which there's going to be a lot of talk about the the movement of grain for, for the, uh, from the Ukraine into other areas in Africa, um, and how one ship has been redirected, and that it's possible that the grain is being sold to a different buyer because one buyer has left and the other has come on, which... The UN says that, that it's in the private sector that may not be so um, unusual. So, but at the same time, that they're saying that there has been an effect on food prices that they have come down some. So, let's listen to what happened in the United Nations um, on August eighth, and. 
it's going to be about an hour and a half, an hour and 40 minutes of them talking, uh, especially because of um, press statements made by the Palestinians and the press statements made by the Israeli ambassadors to the UN. I can only disappoint. Okay. Maybe I should ask one of you to come up and brief today. Yeah. yeah. I still, I still have a few college funds to pay for, Said. So. All right. Good afternoon. Um, the Secretary General. Secretary General arrived in Ulaanbaatar today, the capital of Mongolia. This is the second stop in during this uh, current trip. As you know, Mongolia is a nuclear-free zone and has also been an important interlocutor of the United Nations in relation to the situation on the Korean uh, Peninsula. The issue of the peninsula will come up in the discussions the Secretary General will have on this current trip. He will then go, of course, after Mongolia to the Republic of Korea. Earlier today in Tokyo, the Secretary General spoke to the media where he stressed that at a time when geopolitical tensions are rising and the nuclear threat is back in focus, nuclear armed countries need to commit to no first use of nuclear weapons and must never use, threaten, never use or threaten non-nuclear armed countries with the use of nuclear weapons. He also said that these requests will be taken, um, he hopes that these requests will be taken seriously because we are witnessing a radicalization of the geopolitical situation that makes the risk of a nuclear war something we cannot completely forget. In addition, he urged Japan to take climate action by cutting emissions, stop funding coal plants abroad, and partner with countries to help them transition to renewable energy. And this afternoon, uh, before leaving uh, Tokyo, he met with Emperor Naruhito of Japan. And you will see that on Saturday, he took part at the peace memorial ceremonies in Hiroshima. Uh, during his uh, message there, the Secretary General said his message to world leaders is simple. Stop flirting with disaster. Take the nuclear option off the table for good. All of the remarks from uh, this weekend and today were shared with you. Uh, turning to uh, the situation in the Middle East, the special coordinator for the Middle East peace process, Tor Venisland, who is in, um, in Jerusalem, is continuing to closely follow the implementation of last night's ceasefire agreement and commitments, including the opening of Gaza for humanitarian assistance. He will be briefing the Security Council um, at 3 p.m. today via video conference uh, to update council members on the latest developments. That will be an open meeting. We'll share his remarks with you as soon as uh, we can. The Deputy Special Coordinator Lynn H Hastings entered Gaza uh, earlier this morning, leading the UN's uh, humanitarian response on the ground. She spent the day meeting with uh, our colleagues as well as other humanitarian agencies, families of people in impacted by the escalation of violence and civil society groups in order to begin assessing the damage and the needs in the aftermath of this current round of hostilities. Essential personnel for the UN Relief and Works Agency are continuing to work around the clock to monitor the situation and to ensure that the uh, delivery of UNRWA services continues unabated. Uh, the electricity situation in Gaza is improving, as we are told, and rolling daily power cuts are ex expected to decline from 20 to 14 hours a day. That's according to our colleagues in the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. For its part, the World Food Program is set to distribute cash assistance to 5,000 people in need. And as you saw last night, the Secretary General in a statement welcomed the announcement of a ceasefire. He said he was deeply saddened by the loss of life and injuries, including children from airstrikes in Gaza and indiscriminate, ro indiscriminate firing of rockets towards Israel from population centers in Gaza by Palestinian Islamic Jihad and other militant groups. The Secretary General calls on all sides to observe the ceasefire, and he reaffirms the United Nations' commitment to the achievement of a two-state solution based on relevant UN 
resolutions, international law, and prior agreements, and the importance of restoring a political horizon. Um, turning to Ukraine, we, along with our humanitarian partners, have today released a revised humanitarian flash appeal. The financial requirements have increased from $2.25 billion to $4.3 billion dollars. More than a quarter of Ukraine's population, that's 17.7 million men, women, and children, will need humanitarian assistance in the months ahead. That's an increase of about 2 million compared to our estimates in April. Uh, the appeal has been extended until December due to the worsening situation. Um, with $2.38 billion already received towards the flash appeal, donor support to this emergency has been unprecedented. The humanitarian coordinator uh, for Ukraine, Denise Brown, has called on the international community to continue supporting our life-saving operations. Our humanitarian colleagues warn that during the forthcoming winter, the situation can deteriorate as more people will be displaced from areas with limited access to gas, fuel, or electricity. Supporting them is a priority. During the first five months of the war, at least 2.3 million Ukrainians received cash assistance. We're also planning to scale up uh, to a target of 6.3 million vulnerable people by the end of the year. Denise Brown stressed that aid groups in Ukraine will need safe and unimpeded access to all war-impacted areas. Since the beginning of the war, access has been extremely challenging in areas beyond the control of the government of Ukraine. She called on the parties to comply with their obligations under international humanitarian law. We've also been sharing with you the regular updates uh, from our colleagues at the uh, Black Sea Grain Initiative Joint Coordination Center on the movement of ships uh, out in and out of the Black Sea. Um, turning to Chad, the Secretary General addressed by a recorded video message the signing ceremony of the Doha peace agreement between the Chadian transitional authorities and political military groups. He thanked the state of Qatar for hosting the Doha pre-dialogue and commended the Chadian parties for their effect efforts in the pursuit of peace which are bearing fruit today. The Secretary General said he hopes that the Doha Peace Agreement will enable the participation of signatory groups in the National Dialogue alongside men and women from all walks of life. He noted that the National Dialogue um, will provide a historic opportunity to put Chad on the path towards constitutional order and sustainable peace, and he encourages further uh, engagements with the groups that have not yet signed ahead of the National Dialogue to facilitate their participation in the inclusive na National Dialogue in N'Djamena, the capital of Chad. Uh, going slightly west uh, to Mali, uh, you will have seen that in a statement we issued on Friday afternoon, the Secretary General and the Chairperson of the African Union uh, Commission, uh, Mr. Faki, welcomed the successful conclusion of the decision-making meeting on certain aspects of the agreement on peace and reconciliation resulting from the Algiers process. They, are particularly uh, they particularly acknowledge the consensus reached by the parties of the integration of 26,000 ex-combatants into the defense forces and other state services, as well as institutional reforms not related to the review of the Constitution. That full statement is online. And uh, I think a rather detailed humanitarian update for you from Ethiopia, which uh, we have not heard from in, in some time. Our humanitarian colleagues continue to provide critical assistance to millions of people across the country, which is facing the worst drought in the past 40 years. More than 16 million people are now targeted for assistance as worsening levels of malnutrition are reported, and more than 3.5 million livestock have died. In the first half of this year, over 13 million men, women, and children received humanitarian assistance in drought-infected areas, including more than 7 million people receiving food aid. Our humanitarian colleagues inform us that across Somalia, northern Kenya, and southern and south southern and eastern Ethiopia, more than 21 million people are already facing high levels of acute food insecurity, following four consecutive failing rainy seasons. The failure of a fifth rainy season this autumn is also likely, according to experts. At the same time, parts of Ethiopia face a risk of flooding in the coming weeks, and more than 1.7 million people are likely to be impacted. 
In northern Ethiopia, humanitarian deliveries continue in the Tigray region, but our ability to distribute it has been limited by shortages of fuel and of cash. In a positive development, 12 tankers carrying 600,000 liters of fuel arrived on, uh, in Tigray on August 3rd, that's a few days ago. However, our partners estimate that about 2 million liters of fuel are needed each month to sustain humanitarian operations. In another positive development, humanitarian food assistance is being distributed in three hard-to-reach districts of Amhara Wag Hams Hamra zone for the first time in over one year. A convoy with food for about 30,000 people got into the area at the end of July. Delivery of additional assistance, including nutrition and health supplies, is being planned. For its part, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization today said that it is scaling up the urgent procurement of fertilizers to help farmers in Tigray sow their fields in the midst of a critical planting season. This is thanks to a $10 million loan received, approved by the UN Central Emergency Response Fund. Moving south to the Central African Republic, a quick update from our peacekeepers there. Uh, the peacekeeping mission reports that it has supported a community violence reduction program titled Tena de Tena, or Hand in Hand. The program has helped create socioeconomic incentives and livelihoods for 52 beneficiaries, including ex combatants and violence-prone youth in the city of Bria in Otkoto Prefecture. Um, and uh, moving to, back to, the, to this hemisphere, you have seen reports of a major fire in the province of Batanza in Cuba. Our colleagues on the ground tell us the situation has worsened in the last few hours due to the collapse and explosion of two fuel tanks. Local authorities uh, tell us that 4,000 people have been evacuated, although the highest concentration of pollutants in the area close to the fire, uh, with a chance that it may spread. I can tell you that the Secretary General joins the UN team in Cuba under the leadership of resident coordinator Consuelo Vidal in expressing his condolences and utmost solidarity with the people and government of Cuba. Our team on the ground extends, uh, is extending their support to the government and are following the situation closely. Um, and we know the authorities have been working around the clock to try to put out the fire. And uh, I was asked about the inauguration of President Gustavo Petro in Colombia, and I can tell you that the Secretary General congratulates President Petro on his inauguration and welcomes the President's commitments to deepen and expand peace, to promote and protect human rights and gender equality, foster inclusive de development, safeguard the environment, and contribute to the fight against climate change. He extends the strong support of the United Nations as the new administration takes on these key challenges and for its effort to comprehensively implement the final peace agreement and carry out a policy of, quote, total peace that includes the regions that have suffered the most in Colombia's armed conflict. And lastly, um, in Sri Lanka, the UN Population Fund today launched an appeal of $10.7 million to deliver life-saving health care to more than 2 million women and girls in the country, in Sri Lanka, in the next six months. UNFPA notes that the country is experiencing its worst socioeconomic crisis since independence, and its once robust health system is teetering on the edge of collapse amidst debilitating power shortages and lack of critical supplies, equipment, and medicine. Edie, get ready. Let me read this first. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, um, thank you, Steph. Um, one clarification on Ukraine uh, first. On the $4.3 billion that uh, the UN is now seeking, uh, what period does that cover? What time? That covers period? from now until December. So it doesn't include the rest of the winter? Uh, no, no, it's now until uh, until December. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we will, given that this is an ongoing conflict, uh, things will need to be reassessed regularly. Okay. Uh, secondly, does the Secretary General have any comment on 
China's decision to extend its military exercises around Taiwan. Yeah, I would refer you to what he said a few hours ago in Tokyo uh, on, the, on that situation. So, I mean, that, his, his position has not changed. And that was in the transcript we sent out. And does the Secretary General have any comment on Kenya's elections today where there have already been a few issues? Uh, on Kenya, uh, you, bless you. <laughs> uh, I mean, it goes without saying that I, I think the, the, the elections that will take place uh, tomorrow will be an important milestone in the country's democratic process. Uh, we're obviously following the developments there very closely, uh, both from the Secretary General's standpoint and our staff in, uh, in Kenya. We hope that the polling uh, and the vote will take place in a in a in an atmosphere of um, of peace and that it'll they'll be free and and fair. Obviously, uh, we have been providing some support uh, to the national to national stakeholders' efforts towards voter edu voter education and conflict prevention. Linda, <clears throat> thank you, Steph. Um, this is also regarding the Ukraine appeal. Uh, you I, shall I say the unprecedented response mm -hmm. to the Ukrainian appeal? I was just wondering which countries weren't the major donors, and also in general the broader contributions. How many countries actually participated? Uh, most of the the, the um, most of the donors have been from Western. Uh, we are to speak UN terms from Western uh, from Western Europe. Uh, I would urge you to look at the OCHA website because of all the appeals are fairly transparent. They list the countries and the, and their and their donations. I, I would like to add that we are extremely grateful for the generosity of donors to our Ukraine appeal, but also we would want to see that generosity applied across the board. I mean, day after day here, we talk about all these these heartbreaking humanitarian situations uh, and we'll say that the appeal is 15 percent funded 20 percent funded um, we know that donors are stretched we urge those donors who give to give more those who may not be traditional donors to also give uh, but there is a human there is a need for cash across the board for our humanitarian appeals just, just to follow up Given all of these appeals, is there uh, sort of an overall amount in terms of, you know, total amount of these? There appeals? is an overall amount. Uh, it is just not in my head currently, but it is on the OCHA website. That's why it was. If to some of them were crusade. Uh, thanks, Steph. I want to go back to the Middle East um, and first to the statement that uh, Mr. Winsland. Uh, issued a uh, few hours after the beginning of the Israeli strikes. Uh, it was uh, notable that he didn't mention uh, that the fact that this uh, whole uh, conflict started by unprovoked strikes uh, by the Israeli army, something he does usually during his Security Council uh, statements, uh, monthly statements, when any a strike uh, when Israel uh, strikes Palestinians uh, or Gaza, and he then sometimes said that it came as uh, with retaliation or answer, etc. So why uh, we didn't hear about that first? Uh, look, I, I'm I'm not going to go into a post-game analysis of his of his statements. Uh, I think he will uh, he will address. Uh, the Security Council uh, in a few hours. I think his position will be made clear. He'll be representing the SG's uh, thinking on that. Our focus, I know his focus, uh, was on trying to get a ceasefire. He worked hand in hand notably with with Egypt and other uh, and other players to try to get that uh, he was uh, away from Jerusalem then arrived back uh, yes what day is today? Monday? Yes, he arrived back uh, Sunday, and I know he's been had been working the phones from abroad and was seeing a number of interlocutors. I have just a quick follow-up also on your statement yesterday uh, that you issued, uh, uh, and it was a notable uh, few things. First of all, uh, there were uh, Palestinian civilians who were killed. Mm -hmm. uh, you talk about that the Secretary General is saddened by uh, the killing of 
you don't mention even that the Palestinians, you talk about children in Gaza, and they also, there is no condemnation for killing civilians, uh, and um, the, the whole um, statement doesn't even uh, talk about the fact that Israel uh, attacking uh, Gaza. You, you talk about the uh, Islamic Jihad uh, using what you call population centers. Did you have investigations for that? What is, where did you base your, um, this, this statement on, uh, regarding the, uh, the, the Islamic Jihad using population centers? Well, I mean, we, we based it on what we know. Uh, I, I don't really, I, again, it's, it's hard for me to, I, I don't want to go into analysis of the statement. The statement speaks for itself. You're all welcome, and that is your, your responsibility to analyze it and take it apart. We use the words that we used, uh, and we based it on the facts that we know. I'm sorry, but why there is no condemnation for killing civilians? I think we've been very clear, uh, we, we've been very clear on all these issues in past statements, and we continue will to do so. Said. <coughs> Thank you, Stefan. Is the Secretary General content just to welcome a ceasefire when it happens for the, before the next round? You know, right after dozens of Palestinians have died, a lot of them are children. I mean, we began this session by talking about honor. Why not do the honorable thing and call for an end of the siege? of Gaza that has gone on for 15 I, years. I, Why can't you call to I, I think now? we've been very clear we've been very clear on that. He's not content with just a ceasefire and if you mm -hmm. see uh, at the end of the statement for him it's about also ensuring that there's a political horizon. I mean, you know, it's, we're, uh, unless there are real political engagement, unless there's a political uh, horizon, uh, we will go from Crisis to crisis, um, and that's his uh, that's his message. Well, you know, as the ultimate guarantor of human rights and so on, this organization, what can you say? What they say this siege must stop today. What would prevent you from that? But we, have, we, have, the call we, we have we have we have called. Uh, to, uh, Do you call today? We have called for the opening of Gaza. We have right? we have done so. We've called for uh, the the opening of Gaza so that. Uh, all humanitarian goods can come in, so that people can go and and and, and, and go to their to their jobs, uh, so that economic life, so that life can can become bearable uh, for the people of Gaza. I have two more questions. One on Misafriyata. We are on looking Misafriyata, an area where Israel is is, is uh, it's, it's imminent almost, uh, ready to uh, evict hundreds of Palestinians from their homes so they can turn it into a free fire zone. Do you have any position on that? Uh, let me look at that situation. I'm sure. Okay, let me, okay. Let me look at One last thing. There's also an announcement to build 1,400, 1,400 um, settlement units today. Would you call on the Israelis not to do so? I mean, listen, I, I will wait for a particular announcement to comment on it, but I think we have been very clear on the illegality of, uh, of the settlements. And we have um, said that over and over again. And we continue to, we will continue to say it publicly and we'll continue to convey that privately. So. Hi, Steph. I have several questions on Ukraine. First, on the uh, Black Sea Grain mm -hmm. Initiative. Uh, the, first, the first ship was only, uh, should have arrived in Tripoli uh, yesterday, mm -hmm. but it's it got delayed. Mm -hmm. Do you know the particular reason why? And today, the embassy of Ukraine in Lebanon said, since the, this ship got delayed, the original buyer has decided not to buy the the the, the, the corn on mm -hmm. uh, on board. So, any comments on that? Look, the 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 shipping. Uh, the, sh the shipping uh, on the on the Ukrainian side of it, the the issue of getting uh, Russian uh, grain and Russian uh, fertilizer back out to market, is a private sector dealings. It's a private sector ecosystem. Uh, what we've been told by uh, by shipping experts that it's not uncommon uh, for commercial vessels to 
change destinations uh, for cargo to be sold and resold while it's already on en route. Uh, that is not something that we're controlling. Uh, that is not something that we, those are not decisions we're involved in. Those are private sector decisions. I think what is important, and, and this is what we're already seeing, of the, the combination of the package deal is the lowering of price on the global market of food of grain, uh, whether it's for humans, whether it's for animals. And, and that's the ultimate goal of what the Secretary General put out, uh, the ultimate goal of the Secretary General's effort in this, in this regard. Um, the countries, you know, I, I think Rebecca Greenspan said this, countries are not the ones who are buying grain. It's all done through the commercial sector. So the, the lowering of prices, is a good thing because it makes uh, it makes the food of price at least at the at the wholesale market uh, lower. We hope that this will trickle down to the retail as well because that's extremely important. And of course, it lowers the price for uh, an organization like World Food Program, which buys grain uh, on the open market. So there's no 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 uh, political interference in this, right? There is zero interference from the UN uh, or any other player for that that I know of um, on where these ships will go to. These are commercial decisions. These are all commercial ships. We do have a World Food Program ship that is supposed to go um, uh, to go in uh, to Ukraine and went into the to the Black Sea ports of Ukraine. Once that happens, uh, we'll update you. Um, but these are commercial decisions. It's it's an it's an open market. What we're pleased with is to see. I mean, and I think the the FAO representative was very clear on that on Friday. Is the the, the wholesale price going down? And the second question is concerning the Porisha, uh nuclear mm -hmm. plant because. Since last week, we saw the, an escalation on that nuclear plant, and the Russian and the Ukrainian side, they both accuse each other of uh, shelling the nuclear plant and make it a very dangerous place. Bad place. Um, and today, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia said that um, the IAEA boss, um, I mean, Mr. Guasi, is intended to visit this nuclear plant, and she hopes that the UN wouldn't set up any interference on the, the IAS visit. So I just want to know first, do you have any knowledge about who really attacked the nuclear plant? And second, will the UN facilitate IAEA to make this visit come true? A, a couple of points. Uh, this notion that the United Nations has stood in the way of an IAEA visit to Zaporizhia is frankly ridiculous. The Secretary General has been working hand in glove with the IAEA and is supporting them uh, in whatever way we can. And again, I would refer you to what he said at the press conference in, um, in Tokyo uh, about 10, 10 hours ago or so, and he was very clear on that. It is, we're also extremely concerned about the situation around the plant, um, that it could be, uh, it could be attacked, um, that it could be used as a source of, uh, of, of attacks, and we very much hope that the IEA will be able to send uh, tech, uh, you know, inspectors and people in to, to go look at what is going on in the plant. Thank you, sorry, Stephen. Chris Aguri, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, two questions on Palestine. Uh, first, on Gaza. After the UN finished the assessment of the damage, uh, will there be any emergency plan to provide aid to the families and people who impacted by Yes, the I mean, uh, we're already doing so. I think mean, our World Food Program is already providing cash assistance uh, to a number of uh, families, I think 5,000. Um, so that's why Lynn is going in. We, we very much hope this a ceasefire will um, uh, will hold, um, and then we hope that humanitarian goods will be able to flow uh, in Gaza without any hindrance. Um, and we also very much hope that there will be increased number, increased uh, fuel deliveries uh, for the power plant, which is goes without saying so critical. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, hundreds of Israeli settlers stormed. Al-Aqsa compound under the protection of Israeli police. 
Do you have any comment on that? Our, our position remains the same, is that we, uh, we are firm believers in the status quo uh, around the holy sites in Jerusalem and call on e everyone to avoid any provocative action. Ms. Salome, and then we'll go to Gregory. A um, couple points of clarification. Ukraine, two billion more needed, and that doesn't include, just to be clear, additional funding needed and other responses as a result of the conflict as well, right? No, I mean, no, this is for yeah, you, yeah, you for, for Ukraine, yeah. And in Gaza, given that you said there is some improvement to the power cuts only 14 hours a day instead of 20 and so on, is it still considered a humanitarian emergency? And I guess it's too soon to have yes. a funding amount. Yes, yet. I mean, Gaza, I think, was a humanitarian emergency before this latest escalation and continues to be. So. The Secretary General, um, uh, just to clarify, the United States and the United Kingdom said that Israel had a right to defend itself. Um, the Special Rapporteur for the Palestinians said that actually uh, there was, it, it could be an illegal response. I'm just wondering if the Secretary General will take a position on that. Is it, I mean, I, I would, um, would. given... How, from an international law standpoint, how is it different from what Russia said they did in attacking a daycare center? They said they were going after munitions nearby. What's, is there a difference in the Secretary General's point of view between what Israel has done and what Russia has done? Yeah, I'm not going to do a compare and contrast of the two situations. I would refer you to the statement that we put out, and I would also ask, beg for your patience, um, and wait for Mr. Venisland uh, to give you the final update in about an hour, two hours and ten minutes. Does she support? Does he support the call for an investigation that she has called for, and even the United States has said that? I think any uh, any, any situation where. We see deaths of civilians need to be fully investigated. Gregory. Thank you very much, Stefan. I, I just to follow up uh, with Zaporovsky power plant. And so, uh, uh, due, due to the procedures that all of the visits of atomic agency uh, should, must coordinate with UN Secretariat, so do you have any, any dates of? This kind of no, I mean, the, the, the IEA is leading the discussions with the parties on uh, on the accessing of the plant. And again, uh, we will be supportive in any way we can uh, so we get that visit. I mean, I think the Secretary General was very uh, clear when he said we fully support the IEA and their efforts in relation to creating the conditions of stabilization of the plant. Um, and then he hopes they get access soon. And uh, I think the quote that he used uh, in Tokyo was that any attack on a nuclear plant is, quote, suicidal. Okay. Uh, welcome back, Paulina Kubiak. We hope to see... 安全理事会第九千一百零七次会议现在开始。本次会议的议程是中东局势，包括巴勒斯坦问题。议程通过。按照安理会战情议事规则第三十七条，我邀请埃及、以色列和约旦代表参加本次会议。就这样决定。按照战情议事规则和以往相关惯例，我提议安理会邀请观察员国巴勒斯坦常驻联合国观察员参加本次会议。没有人反对，就这样决定。按照安理会战情议事规则第三十九条，我邀请中东和平进程特别协调员，Venisland先生参加本次会议。就这样决定。提了，提了，我提过了。嗯。
安全理事会现在开始审议议程项目二。我现在请 w i n n e s l a n d 先生通报。Mr. President, members of the Security Council, the past days witnessed a deeply worrying escalation in the Gaza Strip between Israeli military forces and Palestinian armed groups, primarily the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Preliminary numbers, which have yet to be confirmed, indicate that from 5 August, the Israeli Defense Forces launched 147 airstrikes against targets in Gaza. Palestinian militants launched approximately 1,100 rockets and mortars into Israel, many of which landed deep inside Israeli territory. During the escalation, 46 Palestinians were killed and 360 injured, and hundreds of residential housing units were damaged or destroyed, along with other civilian infrastructure. 70 Israelis were injured with damage to residential and other civilian structures. Last night. Palestinian Islamic Jihad and the Israeli Prime Minister's Office announced in separate statements that a ceasefire had been agreed and would come into effect at 11:30 p.m. on the 7th of August. The ceasefire remains in place as I speak. I welcome this agreement and I'm grateful to Egypt for its crucial role in securing the ceasefire, alongside the UN, and appreciate the. Very important support provided by Qatar, the U.S., Jordan, and the Palestinian Authority in order to de-escalate the situation. Together, these efforts combined helped prevent the outbreak of a full-scale war, and as of this morning, allowed for the delivery of much-needed humanitarian relief to the people of Gaza. The UN remains in close contact with all parties to solidify the ceasefire and ensure that the significant progress made towards easing restrictions, which we have seen since the end of the escalation last May, can be safeguarded and ultimately expanded. Mr. President, the most recent escalation had its roots in deeper tensions, which. Have been rising for months across the occupied Palestinian territory. Tensions spiked across the West Bank in March and April of this year, particularly after five terrorist attacks, the deadliest in years, took place inside Israel. Following these attacks, Israeli authorities increased military operations inside the occupied West Bank, with a significant number of these operations taking place in Jenin. Focused on Palestinian militant groups operating in the area. On the 1st of August, Israeli security forces arrested Bassem Az Zadi, a senior leader of Palestinian Islamic Jihad in the occupied West Bank, along with his son-in-law, a 17-year-old Palestinian whom PIJ claimed as affiliate, was killed during the operation. PIJ immediately declared a state of alert and raised the level of readiness of their militants. In response to the threats, Israel closed the crossings between Israel and Gaza Strip on 2nd August and implemented measures restricting civilian movement in the so-called Gaza envelope. <clears throat> Tension mounted amidst highly inflammatory rhetoric by Palestinian militant groups. The UN, Egypt, and others began intensive mediation efforts to avert an escalation. On 5 August, Israeli forces carried out a strike, uh, a series of air strikes against reported military targets, including against the senior PIJ commander in Gaza who was killed in the attack. Hours later, Palestinian Islamic Jihad and other militant factions launched more than 100 indiscriminate rockets and other projectiles from within civilian neighborhoods inside the Gaza Strip towards civilian population population centers in Israel, including Tel Aviv, Central Israel, and the Gaza envelope. Over the following days, Israeli air. And artillery strikes against militant targets in Gaza, and the rocket launched by Palestinian militants into Israel continued intensively. Mr. President, 
the escalation took a severe toll on the civilian population. I repeat, the figures we are presenting are initial and verification is ongoing. From 5 to 7 August, 46 Palestinians were killed, including 20 civilians, 15 children and 4 women. According to Israeli official sources, the strike killed 21 operatives, mainly affiliated with PIJ. The Ministry of Health in Gaza reported 360 Palestinians injured, including at least 151 children and 58 women. <coughs> At least 10 houses were completely destroyed and 48 severely damaged and rendered uninhabitable. According to Gaza authorities, over 600 housing units were damaged, displacing 84 families. Approximately 1,100 rockets and mortars were fired by Palestinian armed groups, mainly PIDAs, Al-Quds brigades. Some 20% of these reportedly fell short within Gaza Strip, causing damage and in at least three cases, potentially a large number of civilian casualties. UN monitoring of these incidents is still ongoing. Of those that crossed the border, most were intercepted by Israeli Iron Dome, but some caused material damage. Israeli sources reported 70 injuries, including nine children. I condemn the indiscriminate launching of rockets from highly populated residential neighborhoods in Gaza into civilian populated centers in Israel, which puts at risk both Palestinian and Israeli civilians and violates international humanitarian law. While fully recognizing Israel's legitimate security concerns, I reiterate that under international law, all use of force must be proportionate and take all feasible steps to avoid civilian casualties. Children, in particular, must never be target of violence or put to arms in harm's way. Mr. President, against the backdrop of the Gaza escalation, tension remained high in the occupied West Bank. From the onset of the escalation, Palestinians held demonstrations in multiple locations protesting the Israeli strikes in Gaza. The President of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, issued a statement condemning the Israeli strikes and reiterating his call for the international community to protect Palestinians. Mr. President, in addition to loss of life, injuries and destruction of property, the complete closure of areas in Kerem Shalom crossing for six days had severe humanitarian consequences for Palestinians in the Strip. Gaza was on the brink of a humanitarian collapse last evening when the ceasefire came into effect. As in all escalations, there are dire humanitarian consequences and a total breakdown of all normal supply lines and essential services. Basic food, medical supplies and fuel were unable to enter. As a result, on 6 August, Gaza's only power plant shut down, causing rolling power cuts of over 20 hours per day and severely impacting the delivery of basic essential services and facilities, such as hospitals and clinics, schools, water desalination and distribution, as well as wastewater treatment. Gaza's chronic shortage of essential medicines and equipment were exacerbated by the escalation and the closure of airs prevented the daily crossing of some 50 patients requiring special treatment in Israel. The closures also worsened the already precarious food security situation in the Gaza Strip, reducing stocks of basic foods, particularly wheat flour. The ceasefire announced last night has allowed the resumption of essential movement of goods and people in and out of Gaza including the delivery of humanitarian assistance and fuel for the Gaza power plant. I welcome Israeli authorities' timely reopening of areas in Kerem Shalom crossing after the ceasefire went into effect. The opening of Kerem Shalom has allowed for 23 trucks fuel to enter into Gaza Strip today, enabling the Gaza power plant to resume normal operation from 8 p.m. this evening local time. <coughs> My deputy and resident and humanitarian coordinator, Lynn Hastings, entered Gaza this morning 
and is leading the UN and humanitarian response on the ground. She has spent a day meeting the UN and humanitarian agencies, families affected by the escalation, and civil society groups, and assessing the damage and needs. The cost will be steep. Mr. President, the escalation of recent days came a little more than one year after the end of the May 21 escalation in Gaza. The devastating impact of that conflict is still with us today. In the months following the hostilities in May 21, gradual but significant progress was made in opening Gaza for the movement of people and goods. These steps helped ease living conditions in the Strip. It is imperative that we see a resumption of the measures that were in place and continue our efforts to expand them further. We are committed to supporting the full implementation of the ceasefire agreement, ensuring the safety and security of the civilian population, and following up on the Palestinian prisoners' file. Mr. President, yesterday, the Secretary General welcomed the ceasefire announcement and called on all sides to abide by the agreement. I echo the Secretary General's call. I want to make the Council aware of the following. The ceasefire is fragile. Any resumption of hostilities will only have devastating consequences for Palestinians and Israelis and make any political progress on key issues elusive. Ultimately, the underlying drivers of this and previous escalations remain. These cycles of violence will only cease when we achieve a political resolution of the conflict that brings an end to the occupation and the realization of a two-state solution on the basis of the 67 lines in line with UN resolution international law and previous agreements. I reiterate my call to Israel and the Palestinian leadership along with the international community to strengthen diplomatic efforts to return to meaningful negotiations towards a viable two-state solution. Thank you. Thank you the Land, Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I thank China for its able leadership of the Security Council and its convening of this emergency meeting to address blatant violations of the Charter and of this Council's resolutions. I also thank the United Arab Emirates, France, Ireland and Norway, together with China, for requesting upon our appeal the convening of this briefing. Mr. President, Israel claims for itself a right to security that would seemingly justify murdering, imprisoning and oppressing an entire nation. It claims a right to security that would trump our right to life our right to self-determination, our right to be safe in our homes. It claims a right to security that supersedes the UN Charter, international humanitarian law, and human rights law. It claims for itself everything that it denies us. Israel claims it is always defending itself even when it keeps attacking the Palestinian people. If you are against violence, do not excuse, excuse Israeli violence. Do not justify it. Do not encourage it. Israelis' so-called quote-unquote right to security has become a license to kill and it must be revoked. In an international law-based order, international law is the measuring stick for anybody's actions. We are bound by its rules and remain ready to abide by them. What about the other party? Can it keep rewriting the rules as it wishes? 
And can we accept such double standards that undermine the protection of the law everywhere? How many more times will Israel get to justify bombing our people in Gaza until someone says enough is enough? Are you ready to say enough is enough? As the highest authority responsible for the maintenance of international peace and security, how many more years does it get to impose its inhumane blockade on two million people, half of them children, until someone says enough is enough? How many more children do we have to bury until someone says enough is enough? Regardless of who is in power in Israel, there are two constant features of Israeli policy bombing Gaza and advancing colonial settlements and the settlers' agenda. These are undeniable facts. While Israel was bombing Gaza this time around, Israeli extremists were storming yet again Al Haram Sharif and violating the historic status quo. This was an unprovoked and unjustified aggression. Its real reason is barely veiled, the upcoming Israeli election and the desperation to appeal to and appease the extremist. 44, and Mr. Tor Wensland told us it's 46, and they're counting Palestinians killed. 15 children in a morbid power play and display. Israel kills our people because it can. When will the world show them that they cannot? Mr. President, doesn't this council have a clear position on protection of civilians? Are our, civilian, are our civilians' lives less worthy of protection than other civilians? Are they somehow the exception to every rule? Are they in a zero, in a zone where the UN Charter and international law do not apply? Or is the identity of their aggressor somehow enough to justify blanket immunity for the perpetrators and no protection for the victims? The Secretary General's recommendations presented four years ago and welcomed by the General Assembly have yet to be implemented. And here I'm referring to protections. We need protection. Our civilians are entitled to protection. Our children deserve protection. Ala Kaddoum was a five years old. And I'm sure that all of you have seen her picture. Innocent angel. Do you know how hard it is to speak in the past tense of those who are yet to experience life? Ala Kaddoum was five years old, and she was already three years old. She survived the first two, not the third one. Did you hear about the parents who spent years trying to have a child and finally had a son only to have to bury him a few years later. Did you hear about a Nabahin family? Another name added to the long list of Palestinian families who lost four or more of their members, including three children. Do you know how it feels to be powerless? To be unable to provide any protection to your child to know there is no safe haven anywhere, no shelter anywhere, to survive one war and wait for the next one, onslaught. How can I convey these things so people finally understand that those who really need your support to their security are these defenseless Palestinian families, not the nuclear power, not the occupying power. 
How will Israel answer our calls for protection? By blaming the victim. Israel beyond reproach. It kills Palestinians because it has to. And it always has to. If it is stealing our land, it is our fault. If it is killing our children, it is our fault. If it is occupying our country, it is our fault. If it is besieging our people, it is our fault. Israel want peace? That is why it builds Israeli settlements and demolishes Palestinian homes. Israel wants peace? And that is why it needs to expand and we need to live in enclaves. When do we say enough is enough? Should we wait for the next round or the one after? The next aggression, the next settlement, the next forced transfer of civilians? When do we finally demonstrate to the Palestinian people that there is a peaceful path that leads to freedom instead of doing everything to convince them otherwise? Mr. President, a 15 years old child in Gaza has survived a blockade that is older than he or she is and six wars. How many more wars does he or she need to survive before, as before acceding to life? A simple and, sa and safe life in their homeland. The Secretary General stated in his report on children and armed conflict, and I quote, I am shocked by the number of children killed and maimed by Israeli forces during hostilities, in airstrikes, on densely populated areas, and through the use of light ammunition, and by the persistent lack of accountability for these violations, end of quotation. Only weeks after the report was issued, we are confronted with the same patterns of disregard for Palestinian civilian life and specifically Palestinian children's life, fostered by the same impunity. The Secretary General further stated, and I quote, during the May 2021 escalation of hostilities, there were substantial airstrikes by the Israeli armed forces, resulting in a significant increase in the number of cases of violence against children. Should the situation repeat itself in 2022, without meaningful improvement, Israel should be listed. End of quotation. We believe the listing of Israel is long overdue and that the threshold set by the Secretary General himself has yet again been crossed. Torrensland explained to us a similar situation in a condensed period of time, three days, in which one third of the death were children. Mr. President, we express our deep gratitude to Egypt for its relentless efforts to put an end to this aggression. We, we also express our appreciation to the UN and the special representative of the Secretary General and to Qatar and to all those who helped in this violent, abhorrent aggression. But this situation is profoundly unsustainable. Where do we go from here? We know the result of the current equation. Us Palestinians more than anybody else. But another equation is possible. Your actions need to be determined by the outcome you are seeking. The international community and this council have determined in no uncertain terms the outcome we aspire to. We have a global consensus on what the solution should look like. An outcome in, in, embedded in countless UN resolutions, including those adopted by this council. You are not bystanders praying for that outcome. 
who are actors who can decisively affect the outcome. You are the highest authority in the UN system for the maintenance of international peace and security. You are not an organization that make comments and express opinions. You are the body that can change things, enforce things, and decide that things should be done according to international law and to your collective will reflected in your resolutions. Fifteen children were killed in a few days, and many more are traumatized and suffering. They deserve a better future, a future you can help bring into being. This meeting is for honoring them. They deserve to be honored. Every child killed, innocent child, anywhere, deserves to be honored. In three days, we lost 15 children. During his visit, President Biden reiterated that Palestinians and Israelis deserve equal measures of freedom, security, and prosperity. He certainly did not mean by that that the Israelis should enjoy the abysmal level of freedom, security, and prosperity that the Palestinians are currently living under. We deserve the same. These words should be applicable to us, implemented regarding us, enforced regarding us, not only regarding the Israeli side alone. Gaza's fate is not to go from rubbles to rubbles, nor is Palestine's fate to remain under occupation. The Palestinian people's fate is to live in freedom, dignity, and security in their homeland. We need to shape collectively a political horizon that can take us away from the current reality and break the impasse we are in. The Secretary General in his statement yesterday emphasized that point. All of you talk about political horizon. We need to move from saying that to implementing that. We should not wait until the next war or the next election. Peace is never reached by waiting. You need to seek it out with all your strength and determination and the power that you have under the provisions of the Charter. You are very powerful. You can make it. You can enforce it. And we want you to do that. Act now. Save lives. Save peace. Whatever the price Peace must be achieved, as the cost of war will always be infinitely higher. We know our people are the ones enduring most of that cost. Peace is, in, is within reach if the will of those seeking peace proves stronger than the will of those denying it. We appeal to you. Our president always say that not only one hand, both of my hands are extended to you for peace. Do we have undertakers from the other side? You should make it as a security council enforceable and you should not accept that until one party to decide that it is ready for peace, you decide when peace should be the case and you should drag the two parties to the process of peace today before tomorrow. This is our message to you, the message of the victims, the message who speak on behalf of the 15 children that we lost, that we are honoring, honoring them today in the session of the Security Council. And I thank you very much, Mr. President. We want to thank you all for joining us. Ambassador Adan will deliver remarks on the situation from over the weekend. He will not take questions and answers right now. We'll do that after the meeting this afternoon. Thank you so much, Ambassador.
Good morning, everyone. Prime Minister Golda Meir once said that peace will come when the Palestinians love their children more than they hate us Israelis. Unfortunately, this past operation proved just how true this statement still is. The Palestinian Islamic Jihad deliberately fired 1,100 rockets at Israeli civilians with roughly 200, 200 landing inside the Gaza Strip, killing innocent Palestinians and among them, sadly, young children. This is not an assessment. This is the hard truth, and Israel has the proof. This is only one of the videos proving it. What you can see here is the missiles that the Palestinian Islamic Jihad is firing from the Gaza Strip. And you could clearly see that one of them is landing in Jebalia refugee camp, unfortunately king, killing five innocent children. And it happened at the time when the IDF, our military, wasn't acting there at all. But this is only one proof of all the proof that we have from this uh, operation. This is the enemy that Israel is facing. One that is willing to murder its own children while attempting to murder Israeli civilians and children. This is the reason, as even the Secretary General pointed out, that the PIJ, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, deployed their rockets and terror infrastructure among civilian population. The Palestinian Islamic Jihad was preparing and attempting to carry out an attack on Israeli civilians near the border of Gaza, forcing Israel to close down roads and civilian activity in the proximity to the Gaza Strip, essentially paralyzing tens of thousands of Israeli citizens for three days. Last Friday, Moments before the terrorists' imminent attack, Israel had to act against the terrorists in order to prevent their attack. The Palestinian Islamic Jihad is a radical terror organization, armed, funded, and trained by Iran. In fact, while the Islamic Jihad was indiscriminately firing rockets at Israeli civilians, its leader, Ziad al-Nakhale, was meeting with the Ayatollah puppet masters in Tehran and getting orders from them. And you could all see uh, the photo of Ziad al-Nakhale uh, meeting uh, together with uh, uh, Khamenei, so the, the supreme leader of Iran. Over the course of two and a half days, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad rained about 1,100 missiles down upon Israeli towns and cities. Israel was forced to carry out precision and surgical strikes against the commanders, launch pads, operatives, and terror infrastructure of this fanatic organization to prevent them from targeting Israelis. Israel did so with astounding accuracy and extreme precision, taking precautions hardly ever seen in area of conflict around the world. And listen to this. Due to the extensive precautions, there is no other military, I reiterate, there is no other military in the world that has such a low collateral damage rate. Before neutralizing Khaled Mansour, a senior Islamic Jihad commander with much Israeli blood on his hands, the Israeli Air Force aborted the mission three times, I repeat, three times due to the presence of children in the area. The evidence is right here, and again I'll show you, share with you the video of uh, the uh, conversation between the pilots. Okay. 
You have here the translation, but it's in Hebrew, of course. But you see, you see they, they recognize the children uh, in the area, and uh, one pilot is telling the other to abort. The mission is abort. So it happens two times, and only after the third time they attempted, they s succeeded to neutralize this senior uh, terrorist. But this is only, of course, as I said, uh, one example uh, to the way that we try to minimize the collateral damage. And it goes on and on. Is there any other military in the world, in the entire world, who goes to such lengths? They're still talking about the children. There. Now let me tell you all a little bit about the Islam, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. They are a radical terror group with no social or political aspirations. They only have one and on, one and only goal: to annihilate Israel and replace it with an Islamist state. Does that remind you of? ISIS or Al-Qaeda? Of course it does. These groups are no different. They share the same horrifying and distorted vision. But in order to destroy the state of Israel, they fire rockets at Israeli civilians while using Gazans as human shields. This is a double war crime. Yet, as we all saw moments ago, not all of the rockets launched make, make it out of the Gaza Strip. In the process of trying to murder innocent Israelis, nearly 20%, 20 percent, 20 percent of the projectiles misfired and resulted in the tragic killing of Palestinians. These evil terrorists hide behind civilians to murder Israeli civilians and end up murdering Palestinian civilians along the way. Their hate knows no boundaries. Now let me ask you all, how would Norway react to Islamists plotting to fire missiles at civilians in Oslo? How would Ireland react if jihadi rockets were raining down on Dublin in an effort to wipe out the infidels? I think we all know the answer. But that's not all. Just a week ago, a justified, a justified strike neutralized Al-Qaeda's Al leader, Ayman al-Zawahiri. Before leading Al-Qaeda, Al al-Zawahiri was a leading member of the EIJ, the Egyptian Islamic Jihad. Sounds familiar? The Palestinian Islamic Jihad and the Egyptian Islamic Jihad share more than just a similar name. They share the values of annihilating the free and modern world that we live in. And that is precisely why when El Zawahiri was eliminated, this institution, as well as most of the world, gave its full support. This was one step closer to eradicating radical terror from the world. Yet, when Israel neutralizes such terrorists in order to prevent an imminent attack against our civilians, UN officials shamelessly issues deep concern. This is a blatant double standard, and we will not accept it. Before the debate begins today and the Palestinians start spreading their lies, I want to make one last thing clear. I want to remind everyone of the Gaza Strip's history and the event that led up to the current situation that Gaza is in. Friends, 17 years ago to this day, Israel unilaterally withdrew from the Gaza Strip, dismantling dozens of Israeli villages and uprooting thousands of our own citizens. Israel hoped that this step would build trust and bring calm. Yet, despite our goodwill, we did not receive calm. On the contrary, we received more terror. The Palestinians chose Hamas and their terror ideologies over progress and prosperity. Hamas quickly took over the strip, throwing the Palestinian Authority representatives off, off rooftops, literally, and spent 
all their efforts, since then, all their efforts and resources on expanding their terror infrastructure in Gaza. They build rocket factories next to hospitals, weapon storage sites inside schools, and they dug cross-border terror tunnels underneath Jewish towns. This, ch this choice of terror and violence over coexistence and peace is the only reason, the only reason that Gaza is in the situation that it is now in. There is no other explanation, no other. Yet despite all, of the, despite all of the rockets, threats, and attacks, Israel still does everything in its power to make life better for Gazans. Whether it's increasing the number of work permits, allowing in hundreds of trucks full of goods, even in times of conflict, or supplying Gaza with electricity, we still choose goodwill over conflict. But if we are threatened, we are forced to take action. It is as simple as that. In today's Security Council debate, if the Council truly wishes to improve the situation in Gaza, there must be one outcome and one outcome only. To condemn the Islamic Jihad for its double war crimes while placing the full accountability, full accountability for the murder of innocent Palestinians on the shoulders of this radical terror group. If anything else comes out of this meeting, it will be a profound mistake. Israel acted only against the terrorists of the Islamic Jihad, not against the people of Gaza, not against Hamas, and not against the Palestinian Authority, only against Palestinian Islamic Jihad. I want to take this opportunity to thank President Assisi for his efforts to restore calm and stability to our re region, and not, not for the first time. Holding a Security Council debate on the Islamic Jihad, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and not using the opportunity today to fully condemn them and hold them absolutely accountable for their crimes will only motivate them to continue in their destructive ways. I truly hope the Council does the right thing. Thank you very much. Uh, Technical? Yeah, as I said, uh, we'll answer question. I'll answer question uh, right after the uh, Security Council meeting. Is anyone playing any role in the, in the negotiations for the peace process? When you uh, say peace process, can you elaborate? Uh, the truce, I'm sorry. Is the, did the UN play any role in the uh, truce? And do, do you to, see a role for Due the to the point? statements that came out of the UN, so they were uh, in touch. I, I wasn't there, so I cannot uh, comment. I mean, that's a, a question you should ask the uh, spokesperson of the UN. From the international law perspective, how is what Israel, how is Israel's preemptive strike in Gaza different from what Russia claims was a preemptive strike in Ukraine? How does their argument differ from yours? Uh, yeah, okay. I'll answer this question uh, later today, but I think we have a very clear answer to that. Thank you. Okay, great. Look of its deliberation in the open session, and now they are convening in a closed session. Uh, to discuss whatever they will discuss, along with Ms. with, with Mr. Uh, Tor Winsland. Uh, we are uh, grateful for those who uh, responded in a positive way to our uh, request to have this open meeting of the Security Council. And here I'm referring to the United Arab Emirates, uh, China, France, Norway, and uh, Ireland and for all others who went along with that suggestion one of the key uh, things that we wanted to do in this uh, open uh, deliberation is to honor the victims to honor 15 children who were murdered by the Israeli occupying authorities and also to pressure the Security Council to shoulder its responsibility and to act in a practical way to begin the process of implementing its global consensus 
and ending the occupation that started on the 4th of June of 1967 and to uh, pave the way for the Palestinian people to exercise their inalienable rights to self-determination, to statehood, and the independence of their state with East Jerusalem as its capital, and all other rights, including the rights of the refugees to return and compensation in accordance with resolutions of the United Nations. I believe that the lies and the stories of the Israeli occupying authority and their representative of blaming the victims for all of the action of the occupying authority, of blaming all of their action uh, on the Palestinian people is uh, a revolting, uh, disgusting uh, assertion that I can tell you judging from the body language of members of the Security Council that they are rejected totally. And uh, we will continue working with the Security Council on trying to open doors for a mean meaningful process. We will continue in engaging the Security Council on our uh, initiative for uh, admitting the State of Palestine to full membership and we will work also on other initiatives uh, in the direction of a political horizon. Of course, this issue now is not the main issue of discussion. We just left it to dealing with political horizon. But with, in the coming days, we will continue with the consultation that we started uh, for some time in the Security Council. Let me just conclude by saying that uh, continuing to do the same thing, expecting to accomplish different results is an exercise of futility. The Israeli occupying authority unleashed six wars during the last 15 years against our people in the Gaza Strip. Of course, accompanied with attacks against our people in the West Bank, northern part, central part, Jerusalem, um, Masafar Yatta in the south, uh, Sheikh Jarrah, uh, Silwan, and other places, but they fail every time in trying to break the will of the Palestinian people. So they keep uh, deceiving themselves by saying that they have accomplished all of their objectives from this operation and the following operation and the following aggression and that is not true they cannot break the will of the Palestinian people what the international community should uh, pave the way for is to begin a meaningful political process that will end this occupation allow for the independence of the state of Palestine and therefore to actualize the two-state solution on the ground that is what is needed by the international community, by the Security Council. And the Security Council is so powerful that it could uh, take the lead in this direction to stop this cycle of violence. During the course of these six wars against our people in the Gaza Strip, 2,000 children were killed, 10,000 civilians were killed, and Israel is responsible for these uh, crimes that I am sure that the ICC, because it decided to investigate these crimes along with the ongoing crime of settlements, uh, will be uh, moving in that direction. We hope that they will move faster than the way they are, but accountability has to be put in place and those who are responsible for killing Palestinian civilians, children, women, and the vulnerable should face the justice and should face uh, the, uh, should pay the price for the crimes committing against our people. Uh, this session, as I said, is now moving into a closed uh, meeting. Uh, we hope that the Security Council can elevate itself to the level of condemning this aggression against our people. 
We are grateful for Egypt and the effort of all others in having this ceasefire and we hope that it will be sustained and we need the Security Council to implement its resolutions regarding providing protection for the civilian population under occupation. There are many resolutions of the Security Council regarding protection, just to name one, 904, and then there is the uh, uh, position of the Secretary General in his report in the year 2018 regarding you know, protection that should be uh, revisited and should be expanded through existing mechanism. We will be working with his team, the Secretary General, and we will be working with the Security Council with regard to providing protection. The Palestinian civilian population cannot be uh, the victims of these continuous attacks by the Israeli occupying forces and the settlers. And since Israel abdicated its responsibility to protect the civilian population under the provisions of international humanitarian law, it is the duty of the international community to provide protection for our civilian population until the end of this occupation. Thank you. Sam Azim, Al Arab Al Jadid newspaper. Why do you think that the Security Council is not taking the steps they need to take in order to provide protection for the Palestinian people? You have been talking about this subject, uh, this issue, uh, uh, as long as I remember, uh, for years, but yet there is no practical steps happening. And then the second question is regarding Mr. Winsland's remarks, the uh, envoy, the peace envoy to the Middle East, the UN envoy. He seemed to be uh, putting some pl blame uh, on the escalation, uh, or what he called escalation, uh, and the attacks of Israel, some blames on uh, the Palestinians. Uh, what do you say to that? Thank you. Uh, do you want the answer in Arabic or English? Both, wherever you prefer. We do not accept any assertion by anyone that the victims to be blamed. Here we are talking about an aggression that the Israeli occupying authority admitted that they started it with regard to the Gaza Strip and every place in the Gaza Strip was a target and within a span of three days 46 uh, people were killed among them 15 uh, uh, children and four women and uh, 300 and I believe 60 injured and the number is increasing. So with such uh, uh, vicious aggression against our people we do not accept to try to blur the picture for any reason this is a blatant aggression against our people, all of our people in the Gaza Strip, and we condemn it. And we, uh, uh, we work with all of our friends in order to make sure that it will never be repeated again. And the way to do that, in one part we need protection, and this issue, it cannot continue to be delayed, because the longer we delay it, the appetite of the Israeli occupying authorities and their extreme settlers has no limit to continue attacking and killing and oppressing the entire Palestinian population, dreaming that the Palestinian will, will be broken and the white flags will be raised. The Palestinian people are resilient people, brave people, and they will never surrender to this occupation. They want their freedom, they, their dignity, and to live in their own independent state with East Jerusalem as its capital. That will be a matter of time. Now, why would the international community delay the process of, uh, of putting in place uh, the implementation of uh, Security Council resolution related to protection is related to the balance of forces and those who shield Israel all the time uh, for doing and continuing to, uh, with these crimes that they are committing. 
uh, we believe that the international community should uh, uh, implement these uh, provisions because providing protection for the civilian population will tie the hands of those who are continuing to attack the Palestinian people and therefore protecting the Palestinian civilian population would be good for everyone including the international community. We are not there yet. We will continue pushing for that and uh, we hope that we will succeed hopefully soon in our way of putting an end to this occupation because the safety and protection of our people will be uh, uh, ensured once the occupation is terminated and once our people live in freedom and dignity in their own independent state, sovereign state, and in control of our land, our seas, our crossings, uh, our skies, uh, like all other nations, and you know, to uh, put an end to this continuous attack uh, of Israel, the occupying power against our people. بالعربي الإجابة لو سمحت بس باختصار على نفس السؤال لماذا تعتقدون وينسلاند يعني تعليق محل تصريحات وينسلاند ووضع اللوم إلى حد ما كذلك على الفلسطينيين ولماذا لم يقدم مجلس الآن حتى الآن الحماية اللازمة للشعب الفلسطيني شكرا نحن لا نقبل إطلاقا أي رواية أو أي طرح يحمل الضحية المسؤولية عن جرائم سلطة الاحتلال الإسرائيلي للذين يريد investigations فهناك لجان دولية محايدة وهناك محكمة الجنايات الدولية هم عندهم الصلاحيات أن يحققوا بشكل كامل ونزيه حول كافة هذه الجرائم فليسمح لهم أن يمارسوا ذلك وهم القول الفصل وهم الذين يجب أن يقوموا بهذه المهمة دون تلوينها بتلوينات سياسية من هذا الجانب أو ذاك نحن نعتبر أن سلطة الاحتلال هي التي قامت بهذا العدوان على شعبنا هذا العدوان الذي بدأته هي سلطة الاحتلال الإسرائيلي على أهلنا في غزة وهي المسؤولة عن كافة الضحايا والشهداء الذين سقطوا والجرحى الذين هم الآن يتماثلوا إلى الشفاء في المستشفيات وفي بيوتهم بالنسبة لتوفير الحماية مجلس الأمن اعتمد في الماضي الكثير من القرارات الصريحة والواضحة لتوفير الحماية من مثل قرار 904 الذي تكلم عن تواجد دولي مؤقت في الأرض الفلسطينية المحتلة لتوفير الحماية للسكان المدنيين بعد مذبحة الخليل ونص ذلك القرار كذلك على سحب السلاح من المستوطنين الذين يهددوا الأمن والسلم وحياة المدنيين الفلسطينيين في الأرض الفلسطينية المحتلة فمثل هذه القرارات نحن نطالب مجلس الأمن أن ينفذها وكذلك مقترحات الأمين العام في التقرير الذي قدمه في عام 2018 الذي نعمل معه ورحبت به الجمعية العامة على أن يأخذ مداه في التنفيذ وخاصة لجهة توسيع وتقوية المكانزمات الموجودة على الأرض في توفير الحماية التي تساهم بشكل مهم في توفير الحماية تحتاج إلى أن تتوسع وتحتاج إلى مزيد من الإسناد والقوة لتلعب دورا مهما في هذا الجانب بالإضافة إلى تنفيذ قرارات مجلس الأمن شكرا
This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.